Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am uh, Suzanne Wons, the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library. And on behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all for coming to today's book talk uh, by Professor Michael Ashley Stein, Disability and Equity at Work. Um, and there are refreshments, which I'm very thankful to the Dean's Office for providing and hope you all will enjoy throughout the discussion. Um, I'm just going to do a very quick introduction and then, and then we'll um, have the panelists speak. We have a wonderful group gathered here today. Uh, copies of the book are also for sale in the back, thanks to the coop. So um, as you're leaving, if you'd like to pick up a copy, you can do so. And uh, I should, would also like to mention that the session is being taped. So at the end, if there's time for questions and you want to ask any questions, just please be aware that that will also be part of the recording. Um, and with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel. We have, of course, our author, HLS uh, visiting professor Michael Ashley Stein. He's a professor, visiting professor of law and also the executive director of Harvard Law School's Project on Disability. And then next to him, we have visiting professor Elizabeth Eames, I'm sorry, Eamons, the Robert Brousher visiting professor of law. And then uh, HLS professor Martha Field, the Langdell professor of law and HLS professor Elizabeth Bartholet, the Morris Wasserstein professor of law. So thank you all very much for coming and for speaking with us today. And Michael, I'll let you start it off. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and on behalf of the panelists as well, thank you to the library and not only to Suzanne, but to June for amazing support and patience, not only for putting together this panel, but uh, for enabling us all as scholars every day. You're marvelous, marvelous. Uh, we get treated and, and pampered by the library on a daily basis, so thank you so much. So I will speak briefly just to introduce the book and talk a little bit about why we decided to do it and then turn it over to my friends and colleagues, and I'd much rather hear them than me anyway, and I think you will too. Um, and, but it's so nice to be able to play with them, and thank you for making time in your busy schedules to, to do this. At the Harvard Law School Project on Disability, we've worked in, in about 40 countries on various disability-related issues. And as far as employment, I'm showing my age. I think I've been studying the issue and working around it for some 25 years or so. And after 25 years, you know, people invariably ask you, what is the answer to disability and employment? Because it's a global problem. Um, it, what's interesting and what we pointed out in the book is that at times the employment rates are better in some developing countries than they are in OCED countries, which came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, but very often the same issues get repeated over and over again. Stigma, reluctance of employers to do what even economists would refer to as rational self-interest in employing various individuals with disabilities. Uh, the over reliance upon the informal market, self-employment, microfinance, partial employment, whether those forms of employment are much as they are in other sectors, such as gender, even considered employment or valued, uh, or acknowledged as, as being a valuable activity day to day. And so when we work with governments and policymakers, they all ask, well, how do you improve disability employment? It's on our list. What do you do? What's the magic formula? And the answer is, there isn't a magic formula. Um, and that's often dissatisfying to them. So, you know, last week working with Iranian disabled persons organizations, DPOs, they're very concerned about increasing the employment range and they want to know, what is it that we're supposed to do? Or last month working in Vietnam with some of the ministers who very seriously sat down as the minister of labor, invalids, and social affairs, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, and they said, we're, you know, we're moving towards ratifying the UN Convention, and hopefully they'll be doing that this week. Um, but, you know, what do we do about employment? What's the secret? What's the answer? And the answer is there isn't a secret. So let's step back for a moment, and, and what have we learned over the years working both within the U.S. and then looking outwards towards the rest of the world? What's interesting in being outside the U.S., what's interesting being first inside the U.S. is looking at employment and looking at the way we've created our policies. I often sort of shake my head or maybe hit my head and look at many of the missed opportunities. So here in the U.S., we have, for all the good and best reasons, 
uh, rules and, and, and social protection networks for persons with disabilities, the safety net, and it's inspired by all the right reasons of trying to ensure that people have a basic, decent standard of living. And in parentheses, we can dispute that people on social welfare actually have a decent standard of living, but the incentive is, is, is well meant to do so. But at the same time, you know, we, we don't actually have a network of how do we get people into the job, and how do we retain them in the job, and how do we promote them, and do we care about their flourishing so that they reach their highest levels of talents and capabilities. Right now, like most countries, the U.S. is still at that entry point. How do people get through the labor market into the job? How do they get through the threshold of the door? And we have failed in this country magnificently, dramatically. Uh, in 1984, six years before the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, we had roughly a two-thirds unemployment rate among uh, working-age adults with disabilities. The ADA was passed in 1990, repeating that data um, through various surveys and others. And to date, we are now up to, due to the economic crisis, roughly an 80%, it's about 79% percent unemployment rate among working age people with disabilities. Early on in the ADA cycle, the economists and labor economists came out and said, well, let's look at the statute and gosh, it requires reasonable accommodations, something that you don't have to do for any other sector, and parentheses, that's just wrong. <laughs> we accommodate people all the time, whether it's working parents, whether it's people undergoing difficulties with their spouses and others, whether it's people undergoing non-disability classified, but health and other issues, close parentheses. But they said, look, you know, we've increased, uh, we've put this obligation on employers and it's gonna backfire. Employers are gonna affirmatively stop hiring people with disabilities. And one of the first people that came out with that was Richard Epstein, who I adore as a person, but disagree with on pretty much every scholarly front, um, but boy, he's fun. Um, and then two economists from MIT. The problem with all the economic surveys was twofold. One was they used the wrong data, so there isn't a longitudinal study per se in the United States where you could follow the same group of people and see how they're doing over time. You have to couple together the current population study and artificially make a longitudinal study, and they didn't do it from the right period. So labor economist Richard Burkhauser looked at it and showed how actually the decline is from 1984. So it's not the statute. The idea that we empower people but we hurt them in the end, although in a way echoing our, our late friend and colleague Derek Bell, is just simply empirically not, not true. The second issue which was raised by labor economist Richard Burkhauser in 1997 was the one that keeps getting repeated and ought to get repeated. After the ADA, do we really intend people with disabilities to work? Have we put into place vocational training, affirmative action, nasty word around here, quotas, job set-asides, government procurement contracts, job coaches, and other means to get people into the door? Most importantly, have we worked on transitions from school into the workplace? And the answer in the United States, as opposed to several countries, but not predominantly other countries, is no. So having become frustrated with, with both the way that the statute was being perceived, the way that it was working, the way that it wasn't working, because in federal court, you know, and I was an ABA commissioner for a while, the numbers are still the same. We've got a 95% loss rate of plaintiffs under disability employment. Compare that, that's a 5% win rate, compare that roughly to a 22% win rate in other Title VII protected areas. So something clearly was not working. Um, I think we've all been critical of the Supreme Court at one point or another uh, where they went forward and, in my opinion, gratuitously stripped away parts of the statute, even things not at issue in the case before them. But the bottom line is the policies were not there. And so coming together with Jody Hyman, who is just fantastic and brilliant and marvelous and has a fantastic and brilliant, marvelous father who happens to teach here as well, um, Jody and I wanted to think about, well, what's going on outside the US, are there ways that we could look at it? And first we did a, a global study, although I've been studying this for 20 something years at that point, we actually had a team of graduate students and they went out and looked at 
all the policies. And what we found was fairly consistent with my sort of gut reaction. There is no country out there in the world that actually looks at things really intelligently from a bird's eye view and says, here's a sector, in this case disability, what do we do from cradle to grave as far as empowering them? What do we do about getting them into school? What do we do about connecting that with the healthcare system? What do we do about getting them into the employment range? What do we do about their intimate relationships and their personal uh, mobility, their ability to participate in culture, sports, and other activities within society? No government that I know of actually sits down and does that really intelligent view. What they have, more or less, including us, are piecemeal legislations and policies, all of which, or most of which, are well-intended, but which often don't connect. And even if the ministries or justice departments or others do at times communicate, there's no bird's eye view of how do you get this sector into the employment realm. And so what we did was, is in thinking about the book, we recast it as a, can we look from the life, beginning of the life cycle through the end of the life cycle at some good practices, hard questions which don't have immediate answers, good examples, and question whether these are working and whether in fact they are transposable to other contexts. Because as you know, every country has its own legal system, its own culture, its own sociology, its own stigma, its own resistance or inclusion of various groups, including people with disabilities. And so we organized the book by, by the life cycle. Um, it is multidisciplinary and includes lawyers, economists, sociologists, educators, uh, and others. Uh, it is not always in favor of particular policies. At times, it is highly critical. Um, it was very heavily handed as far as the editing, I'll admit that. Um, we wanted to push all the authors to interconnect and so, in my opinion anyway, I think it does read well as a, as a whole document, although I leave it to the commentators to have their own opinions. And this is the best that we could come up with. What are the good policies over the life cycle of a person with a disability that can get her or him into the workplace and ensure that they are happy, productive, flourishing, and so on? Where are the gaps? Where are the problems? And so, that's the book. Thank you. Um, so I want to start by saying uh, what an honor it is uh, to serve on a, a book panel um, responding to the latest uh, of Professor Michael Stein's um, uh, many contributions uh, to this field. Um, Michael's accomplishments, you can read about them right in <clears throat> lots of places, including in, in the book. Um, I wanted to no note a couple of things that um, people may or may not know about him, um, including, well, so he's, you know, he's a graduate of, of this law school and, and also a fellow graduate of a PhD program uh, in, at Cambridge University. Um, he clerked for now Justice Alito, um, but he's not as young as he looks, so <laughs> Alito wasn't yet in his current position at that time. Um, he practiced at Sullivan and, and <coughs> Sullivan and Cromwell. He was one of the, he contributed to the drafting of, of the UN Convention. Um, and there are many, many formal accomplishments. He's been head of more things than, than I have, um, I was gonna say digits, but I, I can't quite um, uh, make the metaphor here. So um, I just wanted to mention though, the, the interesting way his writing and work kind of brings together some, a lot of different perspectives, and I'll be a little bit, um, uh, playful in this to say that, to note, right, that his early writing was, you know, squarely in a law and economics tradition. And when I teach some of that work uh, in my disability law class, we go and, and uh, look and try to read between the lines to find the places where the human rights agenda is going to maybe burst through at some point. Um, but he writes and writes well in that tradition. I mean, and, and, you know, and critiques it and, and expands it and moves beyond it. Uh, but there was, he has, a, he brings a richness to this. He also um, has done, been involved in brief writing for Autonomy Inc. Right, a long time ago, and I'd be interested sometime to know how he thinks about that work, but um, who, you know, challenged the not dead yet 
um, activism around the right to die, um, arguing from an arguably libertarian perspective, um, which is also maybe a surprise. Um, so I've also had the privilege to co-edit uh, a volume uh, um, with Professor Stein on disability and equality law uh, for a, a series, the inequality and anti-discrimination law that Ashgate uh, Press did. And, and so anyway, it's a particular privilege uh, and honor to be um, commenting here on this amazing uh, uh, volume. I wanted to pose a few questions to you, um, drawing on um, uh, aspects of the book and, and expanding outward too, and some are more idealistic and some are, are more nitty gritty. And you can pick and choose what you want to respond to. But on the ideal front, I want to start because you, um, you say in the book that the, you talk about universal design um, in, briefly. And you say that the current shortage of investment in universal designs of the built and social environment in low and high income countries alike that could make everything from schools to workplaces to public facilities readily accessible to all has left the majority of people with disabilities unnecessarily excluded from equal participation in society. And I didn't find much involved discussion of universal design, capital U, capital D, in, in the book, and, and, and perhaps I, I missed it, but um, I'd love to just draw your thoughts out on that further. That is to say, do you, what do you think are the prospects for, and again, this is an ideal world. I, I understand that we are so far from it, that to talk about the, the challenges of universal design maybe seems a, a, a quibble, but I'm interested in, and uh, I talk with my students about how we think about where we really want get to get to at the end, if we could get there. And so do we know if we're on the right path to it? Um, do you think that universal design is, a, is, a, um, is an end goal? You know, is, that a, is that the right way to think about the world as we would imagine it if we could make it uh, in our design? I mean, you know the critiques of the challenges, the, con the points of conflict and between different kinds of disabilities, right? Curb cuts with regard to, you know, you, you know all this, right? Wheelchairs as opposed to vision impairments. Um, you know, what do you think uh, about universal design at this point? Um, so second, is work overplayed, um, you know, relative to other spheres of life? So as I teach employment discrimination, uh, as you know, uh, the employment sphere is dear to my heart, and I um, really appreciate, you know, things like Schultz's um, interventions pointing out the importance of, of work to identity. Um, but should work be so important? Um, and uh, I, thinking about this volume, I found myself thinking about there's this 1932 Bertrand Russell essay in praise of idleness, where the argument is that, you know, essentially the kinds of modern conveniences we have mean that we really could have a four-hour work week in countries that have those modern conveniences, and yet somehow we just keep working and working and working and working, and that we may place a kind of badge of honor on work. Uh, and so, as you say, there's a stigma attached to non-work. You know, is the, is our, should the end game be to keep valuing, privileging work? Should the story always be, should the, from the disability rights community, get people into work because otherwise they're stigmatized as opposed to the valuing of work is, is overplayed as a societal uh, matter. Okay, so a few more on uh, kind of specifics. So you bring up the uh, GOA finding, GAO finding about the very small proportion of businesses uh, that use the tax credits available uh, to, um, for employing people with disabilities. And I've been trying to learn more uh, about that. It seems like it's kind of murky terrain, but I wondered if you have a view on, on why, why that is. There are different kinds of accounts, right? Ignorance, but it could be also, is there too much hassle? Is there hassle that could be eliminated? The hassle is something I'm thinking a lot about lately in, in my own writing. Um, so I'm just interested, is there a, a kind of hassle angle on those credits? Um, and then, um, finally, I'll close, because I want to um, uh, leave lots of time for questions after all of us finish. Um, does anything, does much in the field surprise you anymore? You mentioned one surprise, right? You, surprised, you were surprised that there was a, um, that the uh, employment uh, prospects in some developing countries were better than they are in some of the um, developed, so-called developed countries. Um, anything else? What, what, what surprises you these days, either, either personally or within the scope of the, the book and its findings, uh, or in, in what you see in the field these days? You've seen so much and done so much. Uh, it seems like you might, you might not be surprised anymore, but maybe you can enlighten us. Thank you. 
I go next, and then you'll answer all our questions. Sure. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I'm not going to sing Michael's praises, although I certainly could. I'm a great admirer of Michael, and we've taught uh, disability law together, and he's taught me uh, a great many things. Um, this is a wonderful book, and um, I mean, it, it, speaks to, uh, it speaks to getting uh, people with disabilities into work, but it really is part of um, uh, a, a commitment to a view that uh, we should really integrate all facets of life and that we should allow people with disabilities to enjoy all facets of life. And work, of course, is a, uh, is a very important one. Uh, what I really liked about this, I, I know mostly about um, disability law in the United States. And um, in the United States, we know that we adopted the ADA and thought that uh, it was one, one of its chief uh, aims was to uh, be very helpful in getting people with disabilities to be able to have jobs. And it really hasn't been very successful there. It's been fairly successful in, um, I mean, these are all generalizations and everyone can fight with them. They may all be wrong, but anyway. Um, it's, been, um, it's been fairly successful in helping people with disabilities to retain jobs because of the reasonable accommodations uh, mandate. But, um, but if an employer knows that someone has a disability, I think sometimes they're worried that the ADA will impose uh, too many obligations on them if they hire someone with a disability, which really isn't true. I mean, big reasonable accommodations are not required, just little itty bitty things. But people don't know that. They think of it as, uh, um, as something that might be more difficult for employers. And then, of course, there's all the stigma and the, uh, um, as, as is mentioned in, in the introduction, the sort of supposition that employers and that a, a lot of people have that people with disabilities are really uh, incapable of doing a lot of things that they're very capable of doing. So um, what I liked about the book is that we've all sort of said, oh, it's not, it hasn't done that much about getting people's jobs. But then when, um, at least me, when asked, well, so what should you think of, what, what should you do about that? It's been sort of throw up your hands and say, well, what can be done? We need to increase people's consciousness and educate them and this, that, and the other very slow process. What I loved about this book is it really was people describing things that they had done and that worked. And, uh, you know, some of them were small scale, some of them were large scale, but it's, uh, it's, it gives a very good model for people to, uh, to work off of who really do want to make a difference. Uh, I guess I was particularly impressed with the employer-driven uh, um, employer um, measures like the uh, Business Forum on Disability in England or the um, Employability Program that was successfully initiated by a uh, for-profit organization in Brazil where they, uh, where they sought to match the talents of people with disabilities in the communities with employers' needs and where employers were working to, uh, to get qualified people with disabilities to, to, to work in their jobs. So those were um, examples of very successful programs. I don't know if we have anything like that in the United States, but that seemed like a very good idea. Also in Japan and Sri Lanka, the, uh, there were government agencies that were doing sort of the same things, matching people with disabilities who wanted work with employers who were, uh, who were wanting to, uh, to hire them. So uh, there's just lots of good, good I ideas here. Um, there are also, I found very interesting, the discussion of quotas. Several uh, countries have quotas where you have to have a certain number of disabled people at work. Um, or um, I know there also are, uh, in many countries, there are, uh, you have to have a certain number of women on the boards of companies, not disabled people, but uh, so that the, 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 the quota system is a frequent way of dealing with problems of trying to integrate people who haven't been um, fully integrated before. And um, um, I thought the work here was interesting in suggesting that the quota system uh, might not work too well, that employers sometimes preferred to pay the fine, but that also it made it feel like this was an obligation that was thrust upon you and that some people 
uh, did get the requisite number of disabled workers, but just shuffled them aside or put them in a uh, lowly. So, so it, it didn't seem to foster the spirit of uh, it's great to have people with disabilities here and let's see everything that they that, that, that they can do. Anyway, I thought that was um, that was quite interesting, and I think the stuff about a school to work transition is a very important uh, uh, thing. I think there are. I know a good many of the specialized schools here, uh, specialized schools for people with disabilities, uh, do spend the last few years at school. If you're disabled, you get to go to school up to age 22. And they spend the last few years trying them out in different kinds of employment so that when they graduate, they, they will have a job. And that's really key. Um, lots of these are just little individual uh, measures that help a few people here and a few people there. but. Um, but overall, I think it does, does make a difference. Uh, there were a few other things I learned that I probably should have known before, but that definitely impressed me. Um, one was the importance of the atmosphere in the workplace, particularly is the supervisor friendly toward disability or not? I mean, you can really see how that would be of key importance, but maybe people don't always uh, focus on that. Um, also, the extreme importance of access to credit for uh, especially for self-employed persons and a great many people, particularly in the uh, uh, less economically prosperous countries, um, are self-employed. Uh, that's a more realistic alternative than employment in the formal workplace. So the, uh, I know when I was disability, when I taught disability, I taught uh, access to credit, but I never really thought about how important it was and uh, uh, it would be terribly important. Um, and also, uh, uh, another theme was uh, the degree to which, in the United States, our, the structure of our benefit system penalizes people for going to work or discourages people from, from going to work, um, uh, even people who, who could work. And that certainly is a, uh, is, is a mistake. Um, we do have uh, very generous benefits, which is part of the reason that it, that it discourages people from going to work. But, uh, and, but there are very many people who can't work and it's good to have the, uh, uh, the, the, the benefits, but there shouldn't, uh, they should work out some sort of way to cap them other than by saying that you get them only when you don't um, work. So um, I liked the fact that the book emphasized the heterogeneity of the disabled community, which we don't always think about. Um, even um, from the point of view of people who were born with disabilities versus acquired disabilities early in life versus people who acquired disabilities late in life and how there might be um, different policies uh, uh, depending on uh, what kind of disability you were dealing with. I think also a strange thing in disability law is that the group is so uh, heterogeneous or whatever that word is, heterogeneous. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, that is, we have physical disabilities of people who are extremely intellectually able and able in, in, in other ways, perhaps. We have um, intellectual disabilities of people who aren't good at reasoning, maybe not even reading and writing, but maybe emotionally uh, perfectly uh, mature and, uh, uh, and have many things that they can do. And then we also have people with mental illness. And the three groups have, um, they're, they operate together and they're, um, they're a force for disability rights together and yet in many ways they have uh, uh, quite different needs. Not, I mean, they overlap but there are somewhat um, different needs and somewhat different solutions. Um, and I just, um, in this book, as I often do when I read about disability, I just wanted to put in a note for people who are really less able than the uh, that is, uh, well, what I objected to is uh, on page 29, um, uh, the author of that essay talks about, he's talking about all the different kinds of employment that there can be, supported employment, so forth. And then he gets to substitutions, um, which is um, um, sheltered workshops, basically, is what they used to be called. I think they're now called community work, is that the community workshops? I'm never good on the uh, politically correct terms. But anyway, um, 
I think people with intellectual deficits sometimes uh, are harder to integrate, particularly if they can't read or write, they're, and particularly if they're not people who can get um, high school degrees because they can't, uh, I mean, some people with intellectual deficits can get you know, high school degrees and can master all sorts of stuff, but some people can't. And I think we have to realize in um, trying to make sure that we fully incorporate the people who are able to be fully incorporated that we don't too much dump on the people who, uh, who probably uh, couldn't have a very pleasant job in an integrated environment. Ah, maybe they could. That is the job coaches that they talk about, where, um, which are used mostly in cases of individual disability, where you start a job, but you have somebody with you who helps you through all the steps, who teaches you how to do the thing. They might be with you for a year or something, and by that time, you know the job cold, and you're terrific at it, and you're integrated with non-disabled workers. And I mean, that's an ideal situation. But it's very much one-to-one. -one. And so I guess I think that some of these uh, so-called um, community workplaces, um, which are all disabled people, maybe of, of all different kinds of, of disabled people, uh, also serve a very important function and can be I mean, they, not the depressing, horrible ones, but they can be very happy places where people go and they spend the day and they work on something, uh, art or something like that, and they, um, and they feel good about themselves. And they may be able to be more secure than if they were in a, in a more integrated environment, at least until we're ready to provide more of a personalized instruction all around. So I guess I'm saying, Integration is great. Integration is just what we need, and that's the way we're going to change social attitudes towards disability, which is the biggest thing we have to change toward disability. But it may not be for everybody, and you know, we sh there's there is some usefulness of it having, I think, specialized educational programs for some people, and even specialized work settings, uh, at least uh, given where we are now. But I do have one question for Michael which just shows my ignorance. Um, I've really admired the fact that you work in inter international disability, which I think is a whole different field. I mean, you don't just have to parse the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is probably the most difficult statute I've ever run into. But you, um, but you also deal with what's happening all, all over the place. On page 12, you mentioned that uh, states that ratified the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities have, quote, legal responsibility to provide equity at work. And I guess I was wondering what this legal responsibility entailed. Or um, maybe an another way of asking it is, what is the effect of the uh, convention on um, the rights of people with disabilities? for you to address when and if you like. Betsy. So I'm going to make um, three brief points so that Michael will have a chance to answer some questions about, about why I see this as an incredibly important book. Um, so I'm going to talk about importance of the topic, importance of the book in particular in its approach to the topic, and importance to me. Um, so first, importance of the topic. This book helps show what a huge problem the problem of people with disabilities worldwide is and their exclusion from work. And it is a huge problem, both because of the massive numbers, the relative significance of disabilities that many of them suffer, and also because, as many have pointed out, it's potentially a population that's all of us. Um, at some point, it's all of us. So it's a huge problem. I also, in terms of the importance of the topic, I think the concepts that disability law has brought to discrimination law generally is hugely important. It's a contribution to the field. And so it's true, Michael, that accommodations have been made in, to other groups, but it's also true that it's disability law that directly states that making accommodations so as to include people with disabilities is a piece of the anti-discrimination mandate, at least in terms of US law, that's the direct statement. 
that idea is an enormously important idea with a lot of potential for all sorts of other groups suffering discrimination. Um, and the related idea that the goal should be a society that includes everybody, that that ought to be everyone's birthright to totally, fully belong to the society and enjoy its benefits is an incredibly important idea that's unfortunately absent from the way most societies, including this one, are structured. But it's a really important idea. Um, so secondly, the importance of this book in particular, it does an amazing job of describing, I mean, it's incredibly ambitious, as, as I think Martha Field's comments indicate, to take on describing the nature of the discrimination problem worldwide and some of the positive solutions that have been developed for that problem. So that's an incredible contribution. I mean, when I was reading this book, I was thinking of the policy makers, the employers, the litigants, the advocates, and how all of these groups and other groups could take advantage of this of this book in terms of coming up with positive solutions and also be inspired by the description in this book of the problems. Um, so finally, importance to me, and here there's two parts. Um, so partly just on a level of learning, one of the things that I always say to my students, um, both in family law and in employment discrimination, um, is how important it is to know how some other countries and cultures deal with the issues, because usually we're focusing on US law, and then I usually have to immediately admit that I don't know much about other countries and cultures and how they address these issues. So this is an incredible contribution to me, Michael, in that um, just getting an idea, for example, I'll take on the issue of affirmative action. So when I teach um, disability law and employment discrimination, I'm always interested in and frustrated by this individualistic anti-discrimination model that we've used. I mean, it has some pluses, but it seems incredibly limited. The Americans with Disabilities Act was negotiated and passed in an era when our country and our Congress in particular were very, very hostile to affirmative action. So no affirmative action or group um, relief idea really built in in any um, serious way into the, into the ADA here. So I found particularly the chapter on Japan, which goes into how differently Japan um, approached this issue and the degree to which you know, quotas, affirmative action, are just the essence of the mandate, really, really helpful and interesting. I also thought, yes, as, as um, Martha Field's comments indicated too, that it's, it's more complicated than I had thought before reading this, because I'd sort of thought of that as in a hugely positive alternative to our limited anti-discrimination mode, and I think what's interesting about that Japan chapter is the way it helps begin to get into some of the pros and cons of the anti-discrimination approach as compared to a just set out to include this group affirmative action approach. And I would, um, and, and I didn't see it as, um, I didn't read it as particularly negative about the affirmative action approach. I really ended up thinking, well, both have their features. And I would be curious, um, actually, uh, either here or some other day to hear you talk about sort of what you think might be an appropriate actual model for the United States in those terms. Um, so finally, in terms of the, the two-part, um, why this is so important to me or a contribution to me personally, um, I would just say reason to be optimistic. So if you, if you focus on disability law in the United States, it's hard not to focus on the amazing creative way in which our US Supreme Court has gone about destroying, undermining, uh, the most powerful civil rights law ever put on paper, as Teddy Kennedy described, the ADA. So we have an amazing civil rights law in the ADA, and the Supreme Court has been positively diabolical in its, the way in which it has twisted the meaning of this law. So um, we were a leader once, as I understand it, in disability law worldwide, and you know now we seem to be, or at least if you focus on the Supreme Court, in this massive retrenchment mode. But, if you read this book, I think it's hard to think 
that really in the US or otherwise or you know in, in terms of other countries, it's, there's gonna be that kind of real retrenchment. I think this book helps show that this is an incredible movement and it is happening worldwide and it leaves me more hopeful that it's going to continue to move forward. So thank you to, to all three commentators for reading the book, for contributing, for your friendship, and for being here. Um, some quick replies, not, not in any super depth, and then we can have a few minutes, we can take questions from, uh, from our other participants. Um, there were a couple of places in the book where either the authors disappeared or we made them disappear. Um, one was on universal design, another was on transition, uh, which we thought we didn't have enough of. Um, universal design, you know, in theory, I love the idea of everyone being able to go everywhere, although universal design is actually not universal. What I'm more concerned about is at least reasonably inclusive design, and there it often comes down to the individuals who are supposed to implement it. So wonderful, you know, wonderful access laws passed in Israel, and then the regulations don't come out, and even when the regulations are out, years later, um, often not enforced, and so public buildings made uh, new and inaccessible. Uh, or last month in Vietnam, you know, they've had access laws since 2004, and they're just not enforced whatsoever. The inspectors are bribed. Um, international corporations that would never think of doing that sort of thing elsewhere, why not name names? The Pullman Corporation, which owns lots of hotels, they bought a wonderful Vietnamese hotel which had one accessible room. They redid it all, they took out the accessible room. Um, this all will be interesting, by the way, at the end of the month because the Asia Pacific Forum on Disability is meeting in Hanoi and there's a total of eight accessible rooms and they're expecting 3,000 people. Should be interesting, okay. Um, on, on work being overvalued, in theory, I would love it if, if we valued whether it's homework or admin, um, or other forms of, of work, or if we valued social interaction, so that being a volunteer was considered the same level as, as actually getting money for doing certain things. Um, I think the reality, though, for most of the world, which is the developing world, is that if you don't bring in, uh, if you don't bring in dollars or whatever, you don't eat. Um, and many of the people that I meet with disabilities around the world, I meet because they're on the streets begging. Um, so I, I think there, there is a, a value to it, at least instrumentally. In theory, I would like it if we valued many other things, including just being, being and contributing. Um, by the way, on the begging, there's a very interesting study coming out from the ILO on uh, Ethiopian beggars with disabilities. And they have their own internal norms about who gets to beg where and how you do the begging and what you're supposed to say and not say and how you present yourself and very interesting one. Where is um, this coming out? International Labor Organization, ILO. Um, there, there is definitely the GAO report and, and talked about you know, these tax credits and, the, and there's clearly a disconnect because if we put our economist hats on, it's profitable to hire people and get a $5,000 tax credit if their accommodation costs $4,999 or less, and then you couple it with a $15,000 retrofitting one-time credit. People have tried to study this. There were two, uh, two social workers who were trying to study this comparatively. They were in Haifa, uh, and they basically gave up at some point. But there is clearly a disconnect between what some corporations, not all, you know, some corporations say up here on top, we want to be diverse, we want the best people possible, we want the best environment, and what happens somewhere at the hiring, retention, and moving forward level. I'm, no one's quite figured out why that disconnect arises. On the flip side of it, you know, we, we've all taught, well, it's been years for me, you know, we all taught em employment discrimination and then we usually frame it in terms of the heuristic is or the employer who's excluding and doing all these nefarious things. Um, employers are people um, and there actually are lots of examples at, at HPOB we're trying to highlight some in China. I have an external PhD student who's looking at it in Vietnam. 
there are lots of employers who actually go forward and affirmatively hire people with disabilities for all sorts of, of reasons. And a lot of the rhetoric tends to focus on the negative side rather than on the positive examples. And I think in a way that's, that's a little bit of our, our loss. Um, as far as surprises, I'm always surprised. Um, most of all, I'm, I'm surprised just by the, the generosity and spirit and resilience of people with disabilities because as critical as I am or may have been about what goes on here in the US, anytime I leave the US and then come back, I think, my God, I've got it easy. I'm so lucky. Um, and by that I mean, you know, the people in, you know, in the slums of Dhaka who literally were, insisted that we ate dinner with them and they were not going to eat for some time if we did that. Um, but they would have been mortally offended if we didn't do that. So of course we thought about something and hired them as you know, supervisors so we could pass them some money and, and do it. But just the, the generosity of individuals, the resilience of people, because you go to their countries and you talk about the CRPD, the convention, and you talk about things will change, but you get back on the plane. And their lives are not very nice for the next 5, 10, 15 years. And instead, they're just so happy that you've come out there and worked with them, and they're so optimistic, and they're so full of energy, and I guess that's what bounces back to us, a lot of the energy. Um, the role of employers, uh, Martha, you're, you're right. Um, you know, one of my hats is, is a board member on the National Organization on Disability, and there we work primarily on employment, and pretty much every program that, that we do that's funded somehow seems to do well as far as getting people into the workplace and retaining them. Um, and that's including initiatives by Walmart and Lowe's and, and many others. Um, and they find out, as Gary Sipperstein, who's across the river, found out many years ago, those who hire continue to hire, those who don't, don't. Um, and what they also found out is that when they redo the way of modality of the workplace, in many cases with Lowe's and, and Walmart, it had to do with these distribution centers that are around the country. So you put your order in on the internet and it goes to someplace in Kansas or Oklahoma where you know, all the materials are stored. And they redid it, so it's pictograms instead of words and it's you know, different ways of organizing and accountability. And they found out that the non-disabled people liked it too. So with technology and with all these advances and rethinking how we do things, Actually, there are very good, good practices, but they're slow, and employers are resistant to, to change. And I think there's a strong autonomy um, stream in it in which employers say, I created this workplace, it's efficient, it's, it's profitable, don't tell me how to do it. And that's pretty much what we teach when we do employment discrimination. Um, your comment on sheltered workshops, which we do call them still that, um, it's gotten a little bit better here in the U.S. once we passed uh, the law that there's no more exclusions for minimum wage for people with intellectual and other disabilities working in that. That was uh, an Obama executive order. Um, but there was a big to-do back and forth. The global disability rights community, which is comprised mostly of people from the north and empowered places, and in some cases they could be haughty, um, don't like a lot of things. They don't like sheltered workshops, and in some cases there are lots of good reasons for that because they can be exploitive. Um, they don't like rehabilitation, which, you know, come with me to, you know, to rural Thailand, and let's talk about why wheelchairs or prosthetics are a bad thing. Um, but one of the things they pushed very hard against was the sheltered workshops. So the article under the CRPD, to combine your next question, is very much focused on getting people into the open labor market but many groups, including the International Labor Organization and others, believe that there is a place for some people with certain types of disabilities to work, assuming that we can protect them against exploitation. So if we actually look at that article on work, we see that the, um, the protections against slavery, exploitation, you know, stripping of union rights um, is, is actually there in order to protect those sheltered workshops that will continue. But otherwise, the actual ratifiers and the article itself requires that states put in positive measures. So everything we don't have in a strictly civil rights regime. It could be affirmative action, which is named by name. Um, it could be quotas, which there was quite a to do about it, so the word quotas does not appear on the, on the text. 
Uh, it could be job set-asides, et cetera. It's all those things that in a civil rights regime we draw a line and say from here forward, no more discrimination. Okay, but how do we get people into work? And how do we balance that, that historical inequity? And those are positive measures. So they're required to do positive measures. Um, Betsy, the role of reasonable accommodation is exactly right, and I think it's probably the best thing that we've ever exported, at least on the disability front. Um, and it's used in, in different ways in different places. So in South Africa, it's actually coupled with gender and with, um, and with ethnic minorities under the Employment Equity Act. So it's actually broader than just disability, which I think is kind of neat. Um, Japan, you know, there's different views about it. They've been desperate for anti-discrimination for a long time and have sent waves and waves of study tours and funded by their cabinet to look at the ADA. And, you know, when I or others meet with them, we say, ADA, wonderful on some things, but do you really want to litigate? You know, or do you really want to have this unfriendly interaction when your historical culture is to have lifelong employment and, and interaction? Um, but the quota is interesting and worthwhile for other reasons because they give you a double dip if you employ those who are hardest to employ, those, as they characterize them, severe disabilities, intellectual disabilities. But at the end of the day, it also comes down to culture and to individuals. So uh, TODA, Tokyo University, was hiring individuals with intellectual disabilities to be gardeners. And... Uh, that was going fine, except for some of the parents saw these individuals look different, and they went and complained to one of the vice presidents. You know, they would all show up, they would dress in these brown uniforms with their rakes and all form a line and do their gardening in the morning. Um, well, the, the vice president, who was the head of the initiative to hire these individuals, wasn't very keen on that idea, and so the next day, six o'clock in the morning, out comes the five they're all guys, uh, guys in the brown uniforms, and there's a sixth one in the uniform, and it's the vice president of Tauda University who goes around and gardens with the, with the five people. So attitudes, individual buy-ins, always important. The Supreme Court, my goodness, we won't finish if we start down that line. Um, I once actually did a symposium on immigration, which is not my area, but I wrote on international immigration, uh, because the bribe was I would get to have dinner with Justice O'Connor, and uh, over, over dinner, I was, you know, polite, because I try to be polite, and, and asked her, well, you know, I work outside the U.S. As someone who's receiving legislation and reviewing it, what could we learn? And, you know, and she talked about defining disability much, you know, much more clearly and much more cleanly. And then she sort of leaned over after dinner and said, you're a very nice young man. Thank you for not embarrassing me. We were wrong. <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, not that she'll fess up to it. And finally, the, the U.S. role, again, once you, know, once you leave the U.S. and, and come back, you, you really do think that we're doing overall in somewhere, in some areas, public accommodation. We're doing an exceptionally good, good job. We're failing on, on employment. And ultimately, with any right, whether it's employment or any of the other rights, um, the question is, is, do we really mean it? Do we really want people with disabilities working or going to school or entering into all sorts of different sorts of relationships, and if so, what are we willing to do to support it? So, June, do you want us to take questions for a few minutes? I think unless anyone needs to get to the next class, feel free to depart, but let's have a few minutes and then we'll take questions. Um, yeah, thank you for very interesting panel. I'm um, interested in across the international spectrum where you're seeing the most innovation in terms of employment for people with disabilities. Are you seeing in the private sector, the not for profit sector, the public um, sector? Uh, and where are you seeing the most exploitation of everything? Uh, if I had to give a quick generalised answer, public private partnerships where the government is putting some of the money, but the private business, which actually knows how to run a business, um, is, is doing it. And there, there's a delicate balance between what sort of people are they hiring, what percentage will have disabilities, what type of disabilities. Um, one of the best aspects of both the J Japanese and Korean quota system is that they plow money, each of them respectively, back into an agency 
that then tries to brainstorm on interesting innovations. Great question. Um, there is some push, and even I've been part of it in some writing, about thinking more broadly, by the way, than just about disability, but thinking about the population and social inclusion rather than disability specifically. Um, in most of, in, in much of the developing world, we're still at the point where individual disabilities are fighting with each other. It's not very helpful. Um, the universal design is not universal because we don't cover every single individual, but we cover most and many, and my personal perspective is dealing with, with umbrellas and with broad policies um, and broad notions of inclusion gets us moving forward more than devolving down and then having the competition between groups, whether it's intra-disability or we call them vulnerable populations, or you know, between disability and other populations. But Maybe my friends have other ideas or thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if maybe the, maybe the Supreme Court's resistance to the uh, ADA, which has certainly been uh, obvious, is, a, um, is partly a worry that too many people will be included. That yeah. is, there, there's some tension between having really meaningful remedies that are totally helpful to people <clears> and <throat> including very broad groups of, of people. And, I mean, people with learning disabilities are often a, a con considered a, an in-between group, but maybe that's one thing that's, and, and, I, and I think that's a difficult problem. Mm. Well, and mm. also the, the move in the ADA Amendments Act is in an odd way towards a, a little bit of splintering, not along lines of different disabilities, but between the regarded as folks regarded as and the actually disabled so that there now are different remedies with regard to the different groups, right? So that the accommodation um, right is only available to those who are actually disabled, which might, you know, it, it, it seems right in principle to make sense, because why do you need an accommodation if you're not actually disabled, except that <clears throat> unless everyone really is included within that group of actually disabled, then there might be a need for accommodation, right, under the the regarded as side of things, right? So it depends on how broadly or narrowly that's defined, but otherwise there's some splintering where you get that sense of, of only people who are really, really disabled, you know, get the, the full panoply of rights, right? And then those who are less so, maybe not. So there's, there, there's that kind of, at the same time that Congress steps in and says, court, you got it wrong, you know, we meant something much broader, there's still this odd kind of, I think, division. and. and I don't know that it's going to make much, it looks like the, at least the courts so far are, are moving in the direction of uh, respecting the broader definition of disability. And so that may not, you know, I think the consequences are overall good, but I think it's interesting along these lines, that move. And they also have specific provisions for blindness, mm -hmm. and maybe a couple of other things too, but that's, a, that's one way in which they, uh, yeah. Well, more than that, for seeing eye dogs for, too. Yeah. Yeah service animals. Okay, on behalf of the library, I would like to thank Professor Stein and our panel today for joining us for this wonderful conversation. Thank you once again, and please don't leave because I also want to